The Art of Living Consciously The Power of Awareness to Transform Everyday Life by Nathaniel Brandon Part 2 Context determines what state of consciousness is appropriate. Generally speaking, it is our actions, values, and goals that deter mine. What is the appropriate mind state in any particular situa, tie-in? Right. Now, I have given myself the assignment of writing about consciousness and context. That purpose keeps me focused on the issues we have been discussing and the steps needed to develop my points clearly. At the same time, I am vaguely aware of the shouting and laughing. Sounds of two of our visiting grandchildren who are playing in the swimming pool, I think it would be enjoyable to get up from my computer and join them, but then I think that I would like to complete this section as rapidly as possible so I pull my mind back to the task at hand. As I continue to write, the sounds recede in my conscious awareness. Very little has the power to reach me now but the thoughts rising in my mind or forming on the screen in front of me. My concentration is so intense I am almost in a trance state. That state is appropriate right now. It serves my purpose. But I know that later, when I join my wife and grandchildren for dinner, I will need to leave this state and shift to another. If I persisted, in this state at the dinner table, six-year-old Jordan might say to me, Grandpa, where are you? Or ten-year-old Ashley might say, Grandpa, are you still at your computer? When I am with my grandchildren, I choose to be present to the encounter. I want to be conscious of what is taking place between us. So the object of my Focus changes and also the nature of my mental activity, I will not be so oriented to abstract thought but will rather be oriented primarily to seeing and hearing and feeling. That will serve my new purpose, which is to fully experience my grandchild, Dren and the pleasure of their company. Let us say that later, while the children are being put to bed, I go to my office perhaps to meditate. I have no other purpose in this new context than to achieve for a while an experience of inner stillness. I am aware. This may be refreshing or lead to the inspira, tie-in of some new idea for the book, but I am not focused on or attached to possible consequences of that kind. All I want is the experience of stillness. Let whatever Happens happen, and if noth, ing noteworthy happens, this is acceptable. While sitting quietly, I suddenly remember that on my desk is a contract I have to study and I start thinking about it. In this context, given my purpose, that is not appropriate, does not serve me. So I let go of concern with the contract and re-enter stillness. Some time later, perhaps before retiring, I decide to take a look at the contract. Now I engage in a kind of mental activity significantly. Different T from what I was doing when writing, talk, ing with my grandchildren, or sitting quietly, although there is some overlap with the mental processes involved in writing. Now my mind is set to the Assignment of considering everything that might be relevant to this contract, above all, I am concerned with the implications of the statements I am reading and what is or is not covered. Let us say that still later I am in bed making love with my wife. The mental activity is again different. I am not developing a thesis, not creating, not analyzing, not meditating, and probably not talk ing much either. Yet I am fully aware, in the way I need to be for the purpose of the encounter, which is physical and emotional intimacy. One factor will be present to all these activities, if I am operating consciously. I will be present to what I am doing. And I will be 
generating an awareness appropriate to the occasion. In one con, text. A very abstract kind of awareness is called for, in another, a high. Sensory awareness is appropriate. Neither is right nor wrong in a vacuum. It depends on my context, including my purpose. Context determines what mind state is appropriate. But if we are to operate consciously, there needs to be tsongru ints. Between what we are physically doing, what our goal or purpose is, and our mind state. When there is lack of congruence, we are ineffective. If I retained the mental operations appropriate to lovemaking while trying to write this passage or the mental operations appropriate to writing while making love either way, the results would be unfortunate. The principle is, context deter minds what mind state is appropriate. When we act, there is a great deal that we wisely and properly leave unconscious. It is in the nature of human learning that we automate new knowledge and skills, such as speaking a language or driving an automobile, so that they do not continue to require of us the level of explicit awareness necessary during the learning stage. As mastery is attained, they drop into the accumulated rep or toir of the subconscious, thus freeing the conscious mind for the new and unfamiliar. Living consciously does not mean we retain in explicit awareness everything we ever learned, which would be neither possible nor desirable. Learning to ski, I had to be highly conscious of the smallest movements of my feet, legs, hips, and shoulders. Doing so improved my skiing, but if I focused too much on those movements, now, it would impede the smoothness of my skiing. However, if I want an instructor to give me pointers on improving my technique, I might have to focus on those movements again. If we want to be effective, we need to learn what to pay attention to and what to leave on automatic. Again, we can never say what is or is not operating consciously until we know the context. H. We want to be effective, we need to learn what to pay attention to and what to leave on automatic. Strategi es of avoidance. When we seek escape from consciousness, the usual motives are fatigue, laziness, fear, pain, or the desire to indulge inappropriate wishes. The first motive is not ordinarily dangerous and is easily remediable by getting some rest. The other motives can be dangerous, and we will examine them below. But first, let us consider not why we avoid awareness but how we do so. What is our mind doing when we are backing away from something we need to confront or examine? The simplest strategy of avoidance consists of giving up the effort to direct the flow of awareness. We abandon purpose. We surrender to passive drifting. We let ourselves be carried along by mental associations. Our mind becomes a ship without anyone at the helm. This state is not an unnatural one, all of us spend some time in it not necessarily out of an impulse to avoid but merely as a form of resting, and there are times when this is quite appropriate. It is what we do when our intention is to fall asleep. But if we shifted into that state while a teacher was telling us that one of our children was in major trouble, while a spouse was telling us our relationship was in crisis, or while a customer or supervisor was expressing serious dissatisfaction with our performance if we surrendered to passivity, precisely when we needed the clearest thinking of which we were capable that would be operating unconsciously. Another form of consciousness avoidance, reality avoidance, is passive surrender to the feeling or emotion of the moment in a way. That effectively freezes any rational mental activity. 
fear, pain, anger, or some other emotion become one's whole universe, bigger than oneself. This is entirely different from being a conscious witness to one's feelings, experiencing them in full clarity with the intention of understanding and possibly transcending them. This is mindless. Submergence in feeling, a state in which nothing can be learned. This could be the short-term condition of anyone if the emotion were powerful enough to temporarily stop thought. But for a rational mind, this would be a state to be overcome not indulged and even embraced. It is certainly possible to feel intensely and at the same time retain the clarity of one's thinking. I do not wish to suggest an intrinsic dichotomy between emotion and consciousness. Yet it is easy enough to observe that for many people, feelings and emotions are principally a refuge from reality. It is where they go to hide out. They act on the premise that as long as they stay absorbed in the fear, pain, anger, or desire, they do not have to think, do not have to perceive, do not have to connect, do not have to act respond, sibly. I am afraid let the world stop. I am in pain let someone do something. I am angry let no one dare reproach me or challenge me about anything. I want let reality keep out of my way. In this mind state, feelings and emotions equal unconsciousness. Yet another avoidance strategy consists of switching one's mind away from where it needs to be to some irrelevant, in the context, issue. From blaming to alibying to rationalizing to intellectualize, ing to clowning and cracking jokes to any form of mental busy work that can hold reality at bay. Or perhaps the flight might be into action. Suddenly one must get to one's desk. Or do something charitable. Or visit one's mother. Or clean one's tennis shoes, dir ing a snowy winter. Psychologically, what is being avoided in all such cases is con. Siousness. Existentially, what is being avoided is reality. Against consciousness. Motives for flight from awareness. Exercising focused consciousness is mental work and requires an. Effort. This, for some people, is enough of a deterrent right there. When I first wrote about this phenomenon in the psychology of self, Esteem, I called it, anti-effort. Today I prefer to describe it as the problem of laziness. Passivity as a policy leaves us feeling incompetent in the face of two. Many of life's challenges and opportunities. It also leaves us with underdeveloped self-esteem. Laziness does not sound like a very serious psychological term, yet I no longer think we can adequately account for human behavior. Without this concept, there is such a thing as a simple disinclination to exert effort. All of us are familiar with it. All of us succumb to it at least occasionally. If we permit ourselves to do so now and again, either as a legitimate form of rest or a short term self-indulgence, with no intention of permanently avoiding what we no we need to consider then ordinarily no harm is done. But as a way of life, as a persistent response, such a policy is self-destructive. Passivity as a policy leaves us feeling incompetent in the face of two. Many of life's challenges and opportunities. It also leaves us with underdeveloped self-esteem. Fear is another motive that we may permit to paralyze thought. As to what we might be afraid of, there are many possibilities. For example, fear that our thinking will not prove correct in other words, fear we might make an error, fear of our fallibility. Fear that if we act on our judgment and are wrong, it will be our fault. There will be no one to blame but ourselves, and others may hold us 
accountable. Fear of facing truths about ourselves, about our thoughts, feelings, or actions, we have been denying, avoiding, or disowning so as to pro protect our self esteem or our pretense at it. Fear of facing truths about another person that, if acknowledged, might impel us to rock the boat of the relationship or even destroy it. Fear of not knowing how to deal with the realities one is acknowl. Edging. Fear of being overwhelmed by one's inner world once one opens the door to it and of losing one's mind or losing all ability to cope with life. Fear of losing face in the eyes of significant others if certain truths about oneself are exposed, so that one dreads to expose them even to one's own inspection. You might find it illuminating to pause for a moment and notice your own mental state and processes right now, in response to the above paragraphs. One friend who read a draft of this chapter wrote in the margin, this is very powerful. I had a hard time staying conscious through it. I wanted to shut down. To comment on each of these fears in turn, it is not difficult to see that surrender to the fear of one's fallibility is self-destructive. One evades the fact that surrender to fear of choosing or deciding is itself a choice or a decision and will have consequences like the executive who is afraid to exercise judgment and initiative in the face of rapid economic change and watches helplessly as his business loses market share to competitors. Whether in the workplace or in the sphere of personal relationships, success belongs to those who aren't willing to take responsibility for attaining their desires those who respond to life proactively rather than passively, choosing independence over dependence. The same observation applies to surrender to the fear of self-responsibility. If our highest priority is not to achieve our goals but rather to avoid being blamed or held accountable, we are not going anywhere very rewarding or fulfilling in life. Our timidity becomes our prison. The dread we do not challenge sets the boundaries of our existence. Whether in the workplace or the sphere of personal relationships, success belongs to those who are willing to take responsibility for attaining their desires those who respond to life proactively rather than passively, choosing independence over dependence. As to facing truths about our own thoughts, emotions, and behavior, anyone who has had any success with psychotherapy has almost certainly learned about the power of self-acceptance. When we can own and accept who we are, when we can make peace with the fact that our thoughts, emotions, and actions are expressions of self at least at the time they occur, when we can open ourselves to self-awareness, when we can drop judging in favor of seeing we grow stronger and feel more whole. We are not obliged to like or condone everything we observe, but neither do we need to collapse into self-rejection. What clients in successful therapy discover is that, contrary to their notion that if they accept unwanted traits they will be permanently stuck with them, just the opposite is true, self-acceptance is the foundation of growth and change. If I do not allow myself to know what I really think, or think in some context, if I deny and disown my thoughts when they feel embarrassing or troublesome, I cannot bring them into contact with the rest of my knowledge, cannot rationally process and perhaps grow beyond them, can only remain stuck with them. If I do not allow myself to know what I really feel, or feel in some context, and if I deny and disown any feelings or emotions that disturb my equilibrium or my self-concept, I repress vital informa, tie-in about my beliefs and values, of which the feelings and emo, tie-ins are expressions. Therefore, I cannot learn from them, cannot revise them, and I can only go on being frightened any time they threaten to surface. If I do not allow myself to recognize and own actions that now distress me to remember, if I do not take responsibility for them as mine, what will prompt me to act differently in the future? I will have learned nothing.